Hello, I'm Daniel Weiss, your host, and you are listening to my podcast. If you are new to this podcast, my aim is to give you the insight so you learn how to master your mind and optimize your health for the peak performance that is sustainable. Okay, and we are live. So, hello and welcome to another episode. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Nathan Bryan, who is an expert on nitric oxide, which is a pop, uh, very popular supplement nowadays and uh, in the sports performance. But as we will hopefully learn, it is also very important regarding the health in general. So, uh, let me introduce Dr. Bryan a little bit. He has been researching the nitric oxide for the past 18 years and this is amazing and Dr. Brian you have also published a number of papers and studies uh, on the topic so can you introduce yourself a little bit because you have a lot of accomplishments and we would be there for a long time listing all of them yeah, thanks, Daniel. It's really a great pleasure to, to spend some time with you today. But yeah, as you said, I've been in the nitric oxide uh, field and academic medicine and research for the past, uh, uh, really going on 20 years. And so I've spent my entire um, professional academic career doing, studying a single molecule called nitric oxide. And so um, as you mentioned, we've published, uh, I think, close to 100 or over 100 uh, peer-reviewed publications and really, my research program has been very focused. And so our goal and objective starting almost 20 years ago was three things. Number one is to understand how the human body makes nitric oxide. Mm-hmm. And then number two is what happens, what are the clinical consequences of nitric oxide production? And then number three, once we understand what goes wrong in people that can't make nitric oxide, how do we fix that? Because, you know, with now over 160,000 papers published in the scientific and medical literature, nitric oxide is considered one of the most important molecules produced within the human body. So your body cannot and will not get well or perform to its full potential until you restore the production of nitric oxide. And so I think we've accomplished in the past 20 years, we've accomplished those three things we set out to do. Number one, we know how the body makes nitric oxide. Number two, we know what goes wrong in people that can't make nitric oxide. And perhaps most importantly, is we now understand how to fix people who have the inability to generate nitric oxide. And I think this has been demonstrated in the fact that I have, uh, I think, 16 issued U.S. and international patents with nine more pending uh, worldwide. We've commercialized this technology Um, and we're starting to see the benefits. And as you mentioned, I think it's important in terms of sports performance and optimizing performance in well-trained athletes. But for me, the bigger picture has always been on the prevention of diseases that are truly preventable now. And what I focused on is cardiovascular disease, which Mm -hmm. remains the number one killer of men and women worldwide. And for me, that's unacceptable because we know without a doubt that what causes cardiovascular disease and its loss of nitric oxide So the fact now is that we understand what goes wrong in people that are at risk for cardiovascular disease. They can't make nitric oxide, and we know how to fix that. So cardiovascular disease should be like polio. It should not happen because we have the technologies to fix it. That's very interesting because, um, as I found out on your website, and uh, basically to add to your statement, uh, there you said or there is written that um, the nitric oxide is made by recelling our body however the production declines by 10 to 12 percent per decade and starting as early as in your 20s that's correct and there that's just kind of in the general population but you know there's lifestyle and diet that contribute to that mm-hmm. so here's what we've learned we know that you can accelerate that loss of nitric oxide production and get cardiovascular disease or diabetes or erectile dysfunction in your 20s and 30s. But we also know that if you do the right things and if you get moderate physical exercise and you take care of your body uh, and you eat a good, clean diet, that you can actually delay or hopefully prevent that age-related loss of nitric oxide 
and prevent these age-related chronic diseases that really are a burden on the healthcare system, and 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 it's a major problem. Um, so it's, right. I think we still have a lot to learn, but the the knowledge base that's there now allows us to then employ simple things like moderate physical exercise, like a change in diet, including certain things, excluding certain things. And the other, the other problem that I think we'll probably delve into uh, during these next uh, few minutes is, you know, just modern habits like the use of mouthwash, overusing antibiotics, use of drugs like proton pump inhibitors and using uh, antibacterial soaps and this, you know, trying to get rid of all these bacteria. You know, the bacteria that live in and on our body are there to do certain things. Uh, and I think a lot of the collateral damage we do to our body is due to the loss or the dysbiosis of the bacteria that live in and on our body. So this is a very complex science, but I think what's important and what's exciting is that once people understand the importance of nitric oxide in the human body, and then they understand and appreciate simple things they can do to enhance the production of nitric oxide or restore or even prevent the loss of nitric oxide production, you'll see not only a dramatic improvement in your performance, which your audience, I think, is probably athletes interested in improving their performance, but I think on a global scale, people interested in not getting sick. And for me, being in academic medicine for the past almost 20 years, I think the paradigm has to change in terms of treating disease because prevention is much easier and cheaper than treatment. And so once, it's easier not to get sick than it is to get well from being sick. Right. So basically, as I understand, you started researching the nitric oxide and you were um, trying to answer some question like what it is and what it does into our body. And later it's translated by the research like it could be also a possible supplement for athletes. So let's start by introducing like for the as you mentioned for the general population who want to be healthy and who want to prevent um, some cardiovascular diseases why they are important what role that they play and possibly um, how to um, how to improve our efficiency when it comes to converting maybe nitric oxides or how to prevent the decline or of this delay? Sure, that's a great place to start. And I think even before that, I think for those of you, your listeners that don't know, um, you know, there was a Nobel Prize in medicine that was awarded for the discovery of nitric oxide. So that was in 1998. So the importance of nitric oxide in terms of human health has been recognized now for over 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so to start from the first, you know, the first pathway to be discovered on how humans make nitric oxide was through the utilization of L-arginine. And then there, there's, there's a very complex uh, biochemistry and uh, enzymology or an enzyme that converts arginine to nitric oxide. And it's that loss of enzymatic function that leads to the loss of nitric oxide production. And so that's been, and so the, it, most of your listeners are probably aware, there are a number of, of L-arginine supplements on the market. And to me, that's never made sense. I'm a basic scientist to understand biochemistry and enzymology of nitric oxide production. So it's never the loss of L-arginine availability that leads to loss of nitric oxide production. It's the enzyme that converts arginine to nitric oxide that becomes dysfunctional with age and lifestyle and all these other things we talked about. Mm -hmm. So your body loses its ability to convert arginine to nitric oxide. So taking an L-arginine supplement has never made sense to me biochemically because it's the analogy I always use is it's like putting gas in a car with a blown up engine. You're not out of fuel. You're not out of arginine. The engine that converts arginine to nitric oxide is broken. So giving more arginine does not fix the underlying problem. And so that's, that's the problem I have with probably 95% of the nitric oxide marketed products on the, that you find on the shelves you can buy online have arginine, citrulline, and a bunch of antioxidants in them. So it's not to say that they're bad products. They're just not nitric oxide products. There's good things in there. They just typically don't generate a lot of nitric oxide, if any. Mm -hmm. And then the second pathway and the one that's more, uh, the most recent was the use of inorganic nitrate. 
and that this nitrate can then be converted into nitride and then nitric oxide in the human body. And that's the basis for, you know, a lot of products on the market that are marketed as, you know, beetroot juice concentrate. Uh, and then there's some powders, some beetroot powders. Uh-huh. So I think if we take this step by step, because there's there's a lot of complexity in this. So number one, the, the most important point is all beets aren't created equal. So it, just because a product has beetroot extract in it or beetroot powder doesn't necessarily mean that it has nitrate. And in fact, I've tested these. And because I have a number of issued patents from the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, I'm obligated to test these nitric oxide products to ensure that they're not infringing on my patents. And so any nitric oxide product that hits the market, I test. And I have the tools and the analytics that can actually test if a product actually generates nitric oxide or stimulates nitric oxide production in the human body. And I've tested probably 30 different beetroot products from beetroot juice um, to beetroot powders that you reconstitute in water. Uh And about 70% of these contain no nitrate. And so that's a problem. So the number one point if, if, that I want to leave your listeners with is that beetroot juice does not equal nitrate because there are beetroot powders on the shelves that contain no nitrate. It's basically a dead beetroot powder. And the reason for that is, is to, to, to take a beet. So number one, it depends on how it's grown, where it's grown, the soil conditions. Uh, this whole field of agronomy determines nutrient uptake and nutrient absorption. Right. And so organically grown beets actually have less nitrate than conventionally grown beets because they're not allowed to add organic or or, or fertilizers, nitrogen-based fertilizers to the soil. So without nitrogen, the beets can't make nitrate. And then if those beets are harvested, uh, there's no nitrate in them. So that beetroot powder that's on the shelf has no nitrate. And again, 70% of the ones that I've measured have no nitrate. So buyer beware. Don't just buy beetroot powder because you think it's going to generate or have nitrate. Um, So that's that's point number one. And then number two, to get from that, you got to start with a good beet that has good soil conditions. And then when you dry that beet, you know, a lot of people use high heat, high pressure to rapidly dry this into a powder. And then Uh you destroy the nutrients. You destroy the nitrate. You destroy many other nutrients with that. So just because you start with a good beet and have nitrate in the soil, The finished product a lot of times won't have nitrate. So again, that's the first problem. Beetroot powder does not equal nitrate. And then the second, I think, consideration is there are a number of beetroot powders out there, beetroot drinks or liquids that are standardized for nitrate content. And the published literature tells us that you need 300 to 400 milligrams of nitrate per Mm -hmm. serving to see any improvement in sports performance or even reduction in blood pressure. So there are are beetroot products out there that are standardized that tell you they have this much in them. Um, And that's probably, if you're going to start somewhere, look for a nitrate-based beet product. But as I'm about to tell you, you'll find that the majority of the people can't utilize nitrate to make nitric oxide. So I'll, and without getting too complicated, because again, this is a very complex science that the lay people and common people or the people that aren't in this field typically don't understand. So the most important point is that nitrate is inert in humans, meaning that the, the human body cannot utilize or metabolize nitrate. Uh-huh. And so if you don't have the right oral bacteria to reduce nitrate to nitrite, then your body will not get the benefits of nitrate. And in the U.S., this is a major problem because there's a 200 million Americans that wake up every morning and use an antiseptic mouthwash. So they're basically killing not only the bad bacteria, but the good nitrate-reducing bacteria in their right. mouth on a daily basis. So these people, here's the problem. And it's no surprise that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of men and women worldwide because everything we do disrupts nitric oxide production. And I think this started all with good intent. But there's collateral damage from this. And the collateral damage of using mouthwash is that you kill the nitrate-reducing bacteria. So if you take a nitrate-only product that's just providing nitrate in the form of beetroot juice or beetroot powder or even green vegetables now that I see coming on the market, Mm -hmm. that the majority of Americans, because 200 million people on average use mouthwash 
do not get the benefit of the nit nitric oxide from nitrate. The other problem is, so, is, so let's, let's take this step by step. So if you do uh, have the right, let me let yep. me interfuse now. It came to to me or to my mind that a question like, what if you don't use mouthwash and you just use like uh, toothpaste? Does toothpaste also interfere with this because it can also potentially kill some bacteria, right? Yeah, well, most most toothpaste contain fluoride, and fluoride is an antimicrobial. So the bacteria that we focused on live in the the crypts of the tongue, on the dorsal part of the tongue, or the back of the tongue. So if you're brushing your tongue with fluoride toothpaste, chances are that fluoride is killing the good bacteria in the crypts of the tongue. So mm -hmm. my, my recommendation is always, if you're using an antiseptic mouthwash, you should stop because it's doing more harm than good. If you're using, I think it's very important, I'm, it's very important for people to brush their teeth. <laughs> oral, right. good, good oral hygiene is still very important. I'm not saying that. I think the, it is also has been linked with uh, heart health, right? And cardiovascular health, the uh, oral hy hygiene. Sorry. Yeah, that's been known for probably 40 or 50 years that people with poor oral hygiene have a higher incidence of heart attack and stroke and basically all cause cardiovascular events. I think we published a paper several years ago that I think explains or provides a mechanism for that because people with periodontal disease, gingivitis, poor oral hygiene, the problem is the good, the bad bacteria that's causing the plaque, that's causing the gingivitis and periodontitis basically outcompete the good nitrate reducing bacteria for the limited resources. So if you've got an active oral infection, the bad bugs outcompete the good bugs. And so, and then you lead to a, a loss of nitric oxide production. And when you lead to a decreased production of nitric oxide, your cardiovascular system uh, suffers. You get plaque and built up in the lining of the arteries. The plaque becomes unstable. It ruptures and you have a heart attack or stroke. So that pathway is very clear. So I think it's important to maintain a balance of bacteria. So there's been a lot of research on the microbiome in the past 20 years. Most people have focused on the gut. We know that a disruption or a dysbiosis of the gut bacteria causes a number of human diseases. Uh, we think, and we have evidence, scientific evidence to support the fact that if you have an imbalance or dysbi dysbiosis of oral bacteria, it leads to systemic problems. And a paper we just published last week shows that, you know, in healthy people who are taking mouthwash, you know, it can lead to as much as a 20 to 25 millimeter increase in blood pressure after one week. So wow. these, this two out of three Americans have an elevation in blood pressure. And 200 million Americans, or roughly half, uh, use mouthwash. So it's no wonder that people, if, if we're seeing such an increase in, in blood pressure just by people using mouthwash for one week, um, then I think it's important that people think about what they're doing on a daily basis. But uh, getting back to your question, uh, I think as long as you don't use fluoride-based toothpaste and brush the back of your tongue to where the fluoride can get into the crypts of the tongue, I think you're probably going to be fine. Um, but the point is that you have to have these nitrate-reducing bacteria uh -huh. to be able to utilize nitrate from beetroot juice to see any effects of, of nitric oxide. So that's the first step, and that's how this can be interrupted by, and it's not just antiseptic mouthwash. If people are on a round of antibiotics, you know, antibiotics are systemic. So it not just, it doesn't just, antibiotics don't just kill the infection you're trying to treat. They kill the good bacteria in the gut and they kill the good bacteria in the mouth. Yeah, exactly. And there's a whole epidemic of overusing antibiotics and not just in the U.S., but I think worldwide. And then the uh, second, go ahead. Yes, so would also... Mm, antibiotics that would come from external sources like from food that we eat like from you know conventional farming methods interfere with um, with the system I don't know if there's any published data on that that antibiotics derive from eating uh, animal protein that have been treated with antibiotics um, but if it's if it's absorbed systemically and it has antimicrobial effects systemically, it's going to affect the oral microbiome and probably disrupt uh, nitrate reducing bacteria. Yeah. And so the second step in this, so nitrates inert that has to be in humans and has to be metabolized by bacteria. So if you're disrupting the oral microbiome, you're not going to get the benefit from a nitrate based product. 
And then number two, and so basically these bacteria reduce nitrate to nitrite. And then nitrite is concentrated in our saliva. And then nitrite, when we swallow our saliva, becomes nitric oxide in the stomach, provided the stomach can make stomach acid. And that's where the next problem comes in, because people use antacids. I mean, there's, I think, 200 million prescriptions written in the U.S. for antacids. And that's just prescriptions. You know, in the U.S., you can get these proton pump inhibitors and antacids over the counter. So this is the the 200 and something million people, the prescriptions that are written don't, don't even include the over the counter. So that disrupts nitric oxide production. And so okay. then you're, so if people are using antiseptic mouthwash, using proton pump inhibitors and antacids, then not only are they not getting the benefits from nitrate from beet juice or green leafy vegetables or from their diet, um, they're shutting down the body's own ability to make its own nitric oxide because these proton pump inhibitors or antacids actually inhibit the enzyme that makes nitric oxide in the lining of the blood vessel. So again, we, we basically get in our own way. And so the point of all this is, I think, is if once people understand that beetroot juice is not nitrate and nitrate is not nitric oxide, that if you want to make the best, get the best value, if you're buying products or utilizing technology, nitrate-based products typically, will, they work in some people but they don't work in the majority of the people. You have to have technology that actually generates nitric oxide that's independent of the nitrate-reducing bacteria, that's independent whether or not the person is taking antibiotics or uh, antacids and all these things. And the only way to do that is to understand the physiology to the extent that you can develop technology. And when you do that, you actually get patents because no one else has done that. Uh, and that's the basis for my patents. Because we're not... Really, what I do is not, I'm not, I'm interested in nitrate to the extent that you can get it from your diet and you can stop doing things or do things to enhance the metabolism and conversion of nitrate into nitric oxide. But the, the challenge for me is that peop, it's hard to change people's habits. And I think people shouldn't uh -huh. suffer, their cardiovascular system and performance shouldn't suffer because they're doing what they think is good for them, even though there's collateral damage. So what I've tried to do is overcome everything that we do in terms of limitations to generate nitric oxide in the body. So the technology that I've discovered and invented and patented basically overcomes all those steps in metabolism. So we generate nitric oxide. We're a nitric oxide-based technology. We're not a nitrate-based technology. We're, we generate nitric oxide. And so we figured out how to overcome the variability in the oral microbiome because there's not only differences in people that use or don't use mouthwash, but there are cultural differences. So people who live in the UK have a different microbiome than people who live in the US, who live in South Africa, who live in China. There's different cultural and dietary uh, norms that affect the oral microbiome. So right. how, do you, how, do you, how do you create a technology and how do you create a product that you get the same response despite the, the differences in the oral microbiome? That's what we've done. How do you create technology and generate nitric oxide when people are taking antacids because they have acid reflux disease that they can't tolerate without antacids? That's the technology we've been, I've invented and we've developed. So I think it's important for people to, and hopefully this is informative and educational because the misnomer has always been, well, this is a nitrate product. And then the assumption is, well, that's a nitric oxide product. It's not. You know, hydrogen peroxide is made from water. Hydrogen peroxide kills cells. But, and there's two differences. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. Water is H2O. They look similar. They're chemically uh, very different. And so it's the same thing with nitrate and nitric oxide. Nitrate is inert. Nitric oxide is a critically important molecule for cardiovascular health. That in some right. cases, Basically, nitrate... nitrate I, I'm sorry. Uh, nitrates are the precursors and the nitric oxide is the readily available substance. Yeah, so if we use this in terms of, of drug, uh, kind of drug uh, lingo, nitrate would, what, would be what I would call a pre-prodrug and then nitrite would be the pre-drug or the, yeah, the prodrug 
And then nitric oxide will actually be the molecule that delivers the drug-like effects. Vasodilation, cytoprotection, improvement in performance, improvement in mitochondrial efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that the body needs to perform at its best is dependent upon nitric oxide. Okay. So now we have the nitric oxide. We have basically skipped all the process of the my microbiota and uh, microorganisms in our mouth. Yep. And now we have the technology to deliver it directly where it is already available and absorbable and usable by our body. So, uh, do I understand it correctly now? Yeah, that's that's correct. So my point is that there are inherent inefficiencies in nitrate metabolism that are mm -hmm. dependent upon at least two things. Number one, the presence of these oral nitrate reducing bacteria. And number two, the presence of stomach acid production. So it's not just the use of proton pump inhibitors or antacids, but you know, there's some conditions that actually the older we get, the less stomach acid we made we make yeah. and that's just one of these age-related phenomena so to overcome all these limitations and inherent inefficiencies of production of nitric oxide from nitrite you have to have technology that overcomes those and i think the point i'm trying to make and it's not to toot my own horn these are just the facts it's that we have technology that no one else has that overcomes these limitations yeah that's perfect so basically now we can use these nitric oxides and to uh, who would benefit from, I mean, based on what you are saying, everybody would benefit from uh, supplementing with this nitric oxide, but who is really the target audience who would be really benefiting from taking this? Well, my objective from day one, and the reason I got into basic science is to really create new ways to either diagnose, treat, or prevent human disease. I focused on cardiovascular disease because it's the number one killer. It's a big, big target. Every 30 seconds, someone dies of a heart attack or stroke. And so I think it's important for athletes. You know, there are a number of athletes that use this that can improve their performance, and that's well published in the literature. Mm -hmm. But for me, my personal objective is to Number one, get this in the hands of people. So number one is my objective is to educate as many people as I can around nitric oxide. And that's why I appreciate the opportunity to, to spend some time with you today to educate your listeners on the importance of nitric oxide. And so nitric oxide is the loss of nitric oxide is the earliest event in the onset and progression of disease. So the loss of nitric oxide precedes the really the symptomatic stru structural changes in the cardiovascular system by many years, sometimes decades. So my objective is to educate people on the importance of nitric oxide so they can begin to employ strategies that can prevent this age-related decline in nitric oxide production, whether it's if they don't exercise, start exercising. And that's why exercise is medicine. Because in young, healthy people, when you start mm -hmm. to exercise, your body generates nitric oxide. So oh, nit perfect. exercise actually is a stimulant for nitric oxide production. That's why exercise protects you from cardiac or from heart attack and stroke. So if you're not exercising, you should. And again, diet and lifestyle is always my first line strategy. You should only supplement if you have to and if you need to. And then number two, you need to eat more green leafy vegetables. People need to eat less processed refined foods. You need to eat more nitrate because here's the thing we found that, and we published this in rats and we think, we think, we don't know, but we think it will probably translate to humans. But if you give more rats, if you give rats more nitrate in their diet, the nitrate reducing bacteria on their tongue actually improves. And this makes sense because if these, if yeah. these bacteria are respiring on nitrate, and you're not getting nitrate from your diet, they basically have no energy substrate to live on. But if you give them more substrate, then they can repopulate and, and flourish. And actually, you, you improve the diversity and you improve the ability to reduce nitrate. So the epidemiological data are clear that eating more green leafy vegetables is cardioprotective, has anti-cancer effects. And so that's important. So that alone, I think, is, is very important that you change your diet 
eat more green leafy vegetables, take in more nitrate. If you have to supplement uh, with nitrate or nitric oxide based yeah. supplements, then you can. But going back to your question, the whole objective and the way that we can change the landscape of the entire human race is to prevent the loss of nitric oxide. And so I think it's important for people to recognize this before they get sick. And really the first sign and symptom of nitric oxide deficiency is sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction. And it's not just in men, it's in women. And we know that the data tell us that 50% of the men over the age of 40 have erectile dysfunction. And I think that's a, that's a way underestimate because most men, even though they may have erectile dysfunction, they're not going to admit it. That's just right. too proud, right? So, but the fact that 50% self-report some erectile dysfunction is very alarming because if mm -hmm. you have dysfunction in the blood vessels that supply the sex organs, then you have dysfunction in the blood vessels that supply the heart, the brain, the kidneys. And so if you don't take steps to, to fix that underlying problem of loss of nitric oxide, then it's not surprisingly the next over the next 10 to 15, 20 years that you've got coronary heart disease, that you have plaque built up in your arteries and you're prone to stroke and you have kidney disease and you have liver dysfunction and all these things that older people get. So if you recognize this early on and then basically do the simple things that hopefully people are going to learn today of stop using mouthwash, keep good oral hygiene, eat more green leafy vegetables, don't use antibiotics unless you absolutely have to, get off antacids, and then let the body, if you give the body what it needs, the body heals itself. And if you stop taking things that prevents the body from doing what it does, the body heals itself. The yeah. human body is a lot smarter than we are. And so my objective has always been let the body do what it's supposed to do. Give it what it needs and it will do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you mentioned, it's like um, when we feed the bacteria in our tongue, well, by the way we eat, by uh, our diet, we can promote or feed these bacteria and they can uh, repopulate and grow. So even though it was only on rodent studies, I think it really makes sense, like you mentioned, that it will also translate into human model. Yeah, I think, you know, we've become uh, a germaphobic society, you know, because, yeah. you know, a hundred years ago, the number one killer of men and women was infectious disease. And so we've been, we were trained to fear bacteria because it caused death. But with the invent of penicillin and antibiotics, I think they have a place in medicine. Certainly, if you have an infection, um, then I think antibiotics are important. The problem is they become overused. And I think, you know, it's not just the enteric bacteria, but there's, you know, bacteria that live on our skin that generate nitric oxide. And nature mm -hmm. tells us a lot. And so the, the example I like to use is if you if you bathe your dog, or I live on a ranch in Texas, we have horses and cows. And if you if you bathe your horse and then you turn him out to pasture, the first thing they do is they go roll around in the dirt, right? Because you've just, you've, you've basically cleansed them of all the good bacteria that was on their skin mm -hmm. that protect them and do things. And so it's just by nature that they go out and it's natural for them to go. And they have to, they realize they have to re-inoculate themselves. They have to roll around in the dirt and put those ammonia oxidizing bacteria back on their body. So again, this is nature telling us that this is important. And I think we as humans sometimes become too sophisticated and lose our way in, in, in becoming too hygienic. You know, I look on the shelves walking through the store and there's an antibacterial soaps, antibacterial lotions, antiseptic this, antiseptic oh. that. Um, and I think it's doing more harm than good. Yeah, definitely. I, like you're mentioning, also there have been more and more studies on the bacteria overall in the recent years, whether it comes to, uh, yeah, oral bacteria, skin bacteria, bacteria in our guts, which is very popular topic nowadays, and uh, the importance of having this balance, like you mentioned, and uh, it, it's really like a nice spin when, uh, when you mentioned that, for example, the beetroots that are grown in a, um, not biologically, let's say, but with the use of uh, nitric-based um, fertilizers, have more nitric oxide, uh, or sorry, more nitrate. 
That's correct. Oh. Yeah, we published this, a big study, I think in 2013 or 2014, and we actually did a study in collaboration with Texas A&M University because our objective was how much celery, for example, would one need to eat or how much broccoli or spinach or lettuce to get enough nitrate to lower blood pressure or mm -hmm. to, if you're going to run a marathon or go to an athletic event, how much would you need to eat to get enough nitrate to improve your performance? And so we went to five cities across the U.S. We went to New York. We went to Raleigh, North Carolina, Dallas, Texas, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And we bought five vegetables from the same grocer and sent them back to the lab. And we bought conventionally grown vegetables and we bought organically grown vegetables. And we found that there's as much as a 50 to 100 fold difference in the amount of nitrate from one city to the next. Wow. And so there's no way in hell we could ever make dietary recommendations on, well, if you eat six stalks of celery in Dallas, for example, you'll get about 300 milligrams of nitrate, and that's sufficient to improve performance if your body can utilize nitrate to make nitric oxide. If you lived in New York, for example, based on the nitrate content of celery in New York, you'd have to eat 60 stalks of celery to get the same amount of nitrate. And that was in conventionally grown. In organically grown vegetables, they have about 10 times less nitrate. So organic is good in the fact that you're not uh, subjecting yourself to herbicides and pesticides, but you cannot rely on organically grown vegetables to supply enough nitrate uh -huh. to the human body that if the processes are in place to generate nitric oxide. So there, again, and it's a good and bad, and I think it's a balance. Exactly, and I think this is a, well, this topic or this point is very like overreaching, not only regarding the nitrates, but in general, it's not only like black and white. There are uh, advantages and disadvantages in everything, and people nowadays think that okay, now this is like organic, so it automatically is better. It is uh, not organically grown, so it's automatically evil. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the deeper I go into the nutrition and actually like uh, understanding how food is grown, processed, uh, basically uh, how it gets from wherever it is grown or produced into our uh, shelves or even on our plate, there there are so many steps, so many differences, and. Well, all I can say is try to get like locally grown and seasonal food and eat a lot of vegetables. That's probably something that a lot of people or most of the experts agree on. No, I think that's, that's a very good recommendation. And look, what we're talking about is just nitrate. It's known that 70% exactly. of Americans are deficient in simple things like magnesium or selenium or chromium. So these things are deficient in the soil. So I think that's why I think it's important that you have to supplement because of the farming practices and, and the way foods are grown today. We're missing a lot of essential nutrients. Nitrate, in my opinion, obviously I'm biased, being one of the most important because, mm -hmm. again, you can, you can use that to make nitric oxide provided the systems are in place. So, again that we can't it's hard to make dietary recommendations because there's no standardization of nitrate and the fact that most americans and it's we actually there's statistics on this too and we we cited this but americans eating a so-called western diet or what we call the standard american diet or the sad yeah. diet you're only getting about 150 milligrams of nitrate per day and we know we need at least 300 to 400 milligrams in a single serving and so Americans are getting, you know, three to four times less of what's actually needed in a 20 on a, in a regular daily diet. So again, it's no wonder that we're nitric oxide deficient. It's not just from our diet. It's lack of physical activity. It's the use of antibiotics, antiseptics, proton pump inhibitors, antacids. Everything we do basically leads uh -huh. to a breakdown in nitric oxide production. And it's clear again, from the 160,000 papers published in the literature, that if your body loses the ability to generate nitric oxide, bad things happen, starting with erectile dysfunction, ending with heart attack and stroke and death. Well, actually, when we are at the erectile dysfunction, 
Like, uh, it's easy for us men to spot it, even if we don't like, acknowledge it, right? And how about yep. women? Is, is there any kind of warning sign? Well, at least in the U.S., there's a there's an epidemic of, of female sexual disorder, and it's you know things from you know anorgasmic women who can't have orgasms or female sexual arousal disorder. And so, if you just look at the underlying physiology, it's very complex because it's there's uh, uh, neurological uh, contributions, there's hormonal issues, uh, there's vascular issues, and so what we've always mm-hmm. focused on is Every single condition in the human body has a vascular component. And so for men, I mean, the, the physiology of an erection is that you dilate the blood vessels of the penis. You get increase in blood flow and engorgement, and that's what causes an erection. It's the increase in blood flow. But in women, it's the same. So the anatomy is a little bit different, but the underlying physiology yeah. is the same. So the clitoris on the woman is supplied by blood vessels, and for a woman to have an orgasm, you have to have an increase in pressure in the clitoris and in the labia. That increase in pressure comes from an increase in blood flow. That increase in blood flow comes from an increased production of nitric oxide. But if the blood vessels can't make nitric oxide, there's not an increase in blood flow, there's not an increase in pressure, and women can't get an orgasm. So it is just like in men, it's a nitric oxide vascular problem. So all the medicines and the, the, the Viagra story and the PD-5 inhibitors have focused on men with erectile dysfunction, but women have been ignored. Um, but the, the underlying physiology is exactly the same. It's a nitric oxide problem. And when you fix nitric oxide and you restore the body's availability or ability to regulate its own blood flow to the skeletal muscle when you begin to exercise or to the sex organs when you begin to have an intimate relationships or sexual intercourse, then everything works perfectly normy, normal. You can perform to your optimal levels. You can have a good sexual function. But when you can't make nitric oxide, your sexual performance declines, your athletic performance declines, your cardiovascular function declines, and you eventually succumb to heart attack and stroke and death. It's very clear. Yeah, so let's go ahead and uh, let's speak about the implications for athletic performance because this is also a pretty interesting topic and it leads us from from the health which is prerequisite for the athletic performance so we are healthy now we can actually focus on improving it and i know because i was making a lecture on supplementation for performance and one of the supplements that I mentioned was actually nitrates or nit- nitric oxide and uh, as you mentioned there are like B2 supplements or different kind of supplements that are provided and yeah there are also uh, different producers so what should we actually look for in a supplement if we want to use that? Well I think there's at least three things that people should look for and when buying a supplement, I would say 99% of the nitric oxide supplement or the supplements on the market that have a nitric oxide marketing to them are ineffective. So it's a waste of money. Now, with that being said, what you look for is a product that I think it's important that there's patents behind it. Because if a product, if a technology, if a supplement or a technology has patents, it means that there's something unique about it, that there have been discoveries or innovations that make this unique from any other product on the market, and that that product and only that product can contain that because that's the basis of a patent. It's intellectual property protection. So if a, pro- if a technology has patents on it, then you know there's something different, and patents are freely published, so you can – most people don't most, – most consumers don't pay attention to that. They think, oh, cool, it's a patent. Very few people actually look up that patent and see what it is. Uh, So number one, look for patents. It means it's something unique. It's different. It's not a Me Too product. Number two, look, see if there's any clinical trials published on that product. A lot of companies will take an ingredient, and this is the this is how the 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 industry works. They'll take an ingredient, and a clinical trial has been published on that ingredient, and then they'll put that ingredient along with. 20 other things in a product and say, oh, this is clinically proven to do whatever. 
but yet no clinical trial has ever been tested on that finical, finished product. And there's a number of reasons for that. The number one reason is clinical trials are very expensive to conduct. They're hundreds of thousands of dollars typically. So most companies aren't willing to spend the money and put the, the money behind their own science because they typically don't have any science. And then number two, there's always the possibility that your clinical trial won't show the results that you want because it's a very risky endeavor. So if you invest, say, $100,000 in a clinical trial, and that clinical trial fails, that you don't see the benefit that you were hoping to show, you know, you have an ethical responsibility to actually publish that negative data, and then it hurts the company and hurts the marketing efforts because you've basically just proven that your product doesn't work. And so companies don't do that. But companies that actually do clinical trials and put that product to the test, it's number one, it's risky, but number two, it proves that that product actually works. So patents and clinical trials on the finished product, not an ingredient in the product. And then number three is if it's a nitric oxide product, then is the company or the the scientist or the, the formulator behind that product, have they ever published anything in the nitric oxide literature? Are they a so-called expert in nitric oxide? Because Big Pharma has been working on nitric oxide-based drugs for 30 years. And they fail. <laughs> and these are the best, brightest minds in science and medicine. So it's humorous to me, and uh, uh, hearing you laugh, it, it should be humorous to everybody, that people, that if big pharmaceutical companies can't develop safe and effective nitric oxide drugs or technologies, is a person or a marketing person or somebody in a company who's never even studied nitric oxide or published a paper on nitric oxide can suddenly make a nitric oxide product that's safe and effective and going to do what it says it does. It's, I mean, as I've, as, I've, as I've hopefully tried to simplify over these 45 minutes, nitric oxide is very complex. It's a molecule with a half-life of less than one millisecond, one wow. thousandth of a second. So that, again, it's humorous, but this is what we're up against in the marketplace on, cons on companies basically saying exactly what my product technology can say because it's in the dietary supplement space, but yet we use these as placebos in our clinical trials because they're, they're great placebos. Wow. So to recap, to answer your question, what do people look for? You look for patents. You actually spend the time to do the research to see if there's any clinical trials that have been published in the peer-reviewed literature, not a white paper that anybody can write and make up and not reference any cited studies, but mm -hmm. a randomized controlled clinical study that's published in the peer-reviewed literature. And then number three, look at the person or the company behind that product and do a PubMed search. Go to Medline, go to PubMed and put those people's name in PubMed and see if they've ever published in the nitric oxide field. And if they're not, how in the hell can they develop a nitric oxide product if they don't know what nitric oxide is or never researched nitric oxide? And I think if you do those three things, you'll find very limited products uh, that actually deliver on the nitric oxide promise. That's an excellent summary. I really love this. And I think this goes way beyond nitric oxide. It's, I think, in all the supplements and uh, Anytime I hear that, like uh, the statements regarding the product, like you're saying, and they are not experts on the product or on the biochemical processes or chemical processes, they are experts in marketing. And this, is, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I and mean, I think that's very that's very dangerous because you know, there's the reactivity of nitric. If people don't know what they're doing, you know, you can do more harm than good. And these companies who were given you know, a, a lot of amino acids and all this stuff and not controlling the metabolic fate of nitric oxide can, uh, or, you know, giving high dose arginine to a, to a patient with an uncoupled ENOS or endothelial dysfunction causes more damage, more oxidative stress, superoxide production. So, you know, this isn't just, in my mm -hmm. opinion, unethical and deceptive trade practice by these companies but it can be dangerous. And the number one rule for dietary supplements, or really the only rule, is that they're safe. And unfortunately, if people are doing things that they don't know, and it's probably not out of uh, evil or intent, but it's just the naivety 
and the unintended consequences of if you don't know what you're doing in the nitric oxide space, you can do more harm than good. And it's not just nitric oxide. You, you see all these energy drinks that people, I think, are marketing with good intent, but they're causing deaths in children. Um, so it's 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 dishonest. And I think if you follow those three kind of criteria that, that I outlined, uh, you can avoid all that, at least in the nitric oxide space. Yeah, so it's, it tells me that I should remake my recipes regarding sports nutrition and make a clinical trial regarding them. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, not everybody. And, and again, I think it's important to point out, too, that everybody is different and everybody responds differently. So this mm -hmm. isn't, you know, there's there's no such thing as a one size fits all, although I think our technology that, you know, we've been able to overcome, there's still a lot to learn. But I think with six, six issued U.S. patents and uh, more than half a dozen published peer-reviewed clinical trials on what we do with, with five more trials currently underway, you know, we put our, uh, we put the products to the ultimate test because if, if my because product technology doesn't work, yeah, I care because I have a 20 year reputation in the nitric oxide field. I've been, uh, you know, a, a recognized leader and it takes 20 years to build a good reputation and it takes 20 seconds to ruin that reputation. And so I have to be very careful in terms of what I say and what I do and how I put my name to, to product technology. And I'm, I'm interested in the science. And I think if you do good science and then product technology can arise from that science, then, you know, people can benefit from that. And that's my number one objective because I'm convinced the entire scientific community is convinced and we're convincing the entire medical community that patients cannot and will not get well or heal until you restore nitric oxide production. Athletes cannot and will not perform to their fullest potential until they optimize their nitric oxide uh, production. Because the, the data clearly sh show that if your ability to generate nitric oxide predicts how well you can perform. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very important point for athletes. And people, uh, and let me just make one more important point because I think it's very important for your listeners. People train at altitude because they think they thought, well, you're going to increase uh, hematocrit, erythropoietin, EPO, so you're going to increase the ability of your body to deliver oxygen. That's just part of the effect of uh, of training at altitude. We publish studies that people that live in Tibet at 12,000 feet above sea level, they produce about 50 to 100 times more nitric oxide than people that live in the U.S. at sea level. And if people that live in Ethiopia, which is about 6,000 feet above sea level, have intermediate nitric oxide levels. So when you go to Colorado or Mexico City or when athletes train at high altitude, sure, they're getting an, an EPO effect, an increase in, in red blood cell density. But the adaptive effects and the reason that training at altitude works for these athletes is that they're increasing their production of nitric oxide. And that's been, missed, that's, that's been missed in the literature. So if, you, if you're training at altitude, the adaptive effects of that is an improvement in nitric oxide production because you're breathing in less oxygen, so you've got to deliver more oxygen per unit time. The only way to do that is to dilate your blood vessels, and the only way to do that is to increase production of nitric oxide. But number two, you can actually deliver more nitric oxide from hemoglobin if you have, a lot, if you have nitric oxide-based signaling around. So I think mm -hmm. everything that we know about performance and about cardiovascular health centers around the production of a single molecule of nitric oxide. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. And I think that's hopefully why, uh, you know, athletes should be interested in this. But more importantly, people in general should be sick. People should should know about this. And I think from from my perspective, healthy people like you and I who are active and and know more than most people in terms of our health because we practice what we preach, uh, should know about nitric oxide because if you can prevent the loss of nitric oxide production, you can prevent a lot of age-related disease. And that's the ultimate mission. That's an amazing summary. And I really like, um, I mean, at first I knew only about nitric oxide as a supplement, like you mentioned, but now you really opened my eyes into the topic and introduced me and I believe also to anybody who is listening to how far reached this topic is, how deep it can go and we are just scratching the surface so <laughs> That's right. well then I, then I then yeah then I've done my job and you know I, I'm in 
an adjunct professor at Baylor College of Medicine, and so my number one ob- mission is to educate. And so I appreciate the opportunity and always welcome the opportunity to uh, to spend time with people like you who have a reach, who have a passion for, for health and fitness and nutrition, because at the end of the day, the biggest investment we can make is in our own health. Yeah, most definitely. So one more thing that you mentioned actually uh, was that uh, people should do the research uh, regarding the clinical trials and the supplements, like if, if it, uh, there are any researches on the finished product. So I think many people don't have actually time to do that or don't know how to access it and so on. So could we maybe mention some specific products or brands uh, that would be approved? Well, I, do, I, do, you know, I'm not here to, to market my own uh, patented products, I think. Um, but, you know, people can find, um, you know, because uh, I, li- I like to d- divorce the science and the physiological effects of nitric oxide from the products. And, mm-hmm. and, and I'll, I'll tell you the reason I do that is because... I'm, so what I've talked about in terms of nitric oxide improving uh, circulation and improving and preventing and treating disease, I don't want that ever to be implicated that my product technology could be used to treat erectile dysfunction or to treat high blood pressure right. or to treat cardiovascular disease. And so unfortunately, the regulatory environment in which we live, at least in the U.S., uh, doesn't allow for that. But I think if people... To answer your question, if people Google Dr. Nathan Bryan, uh, you'll find me on Google. You'll find me online. I have social media. I do a monthly blog. They can go to my website, drnathansbryan.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Dr. Nitric. Um, but my objective is to educate people, properly educate people on nitric oxide. And I think by default, when they do that, and they follow that and become properly educated, they'll find my patented product technology. They'll find the, the, the products that are out there that actually work, that have published clinical trials. But uh, I'm going to respectfully decline to, to mention those products. Okay. For, for, for... I think you indirectly answered the question, so, or yep. at least gave a short, hand, short way how, to people can, how can people really find these products in the library. Anyway, I think there is always um, benefit of eating foods that are rich of nitrates, even though we cannot know or can be sure of the of the nitrate content unless we test them, which nobody, or nearly nobody does. But, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Look, I, 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 let me just make that clear. I'm not saying that at all because we focus. Green leafy vegetables are very important because mm-hmm. of fiber, because of vitamin A, because of polyphenols, because of vitamin E, a lot of vitamins and, and nutrients that they have that other foods perhaps don't or, or have more. What we focused on is strictly the nitrate content. The epidemiological data on consumption of green leafy vegetables is unequivocally, without a doubt, healthy and good for you. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat green leafy vegetables because you may or may not get enough nitrate. Yeah, did, They're healthy. Like that's that. independent of nitric oxide. Yep. Uh-huh. Well, uh, what I meant or what I was trying to portray was that uh, eating the whole foods is always a good way. Absolutely. Or, or at least a good basis how to get it. So basically, uh, by the words of Michael Pollan, would be like eat the real food, most, uh, not too much, mostly plants. And that's right. <laughs> that just translates also into this. And yeah, so which foods are actually typically high in nitrates? We already mentioned the green leafy vegetables. Are there any specific that are like outliers? Yeah, you know, kale, spinach, and arugula are probably the top three um, that we've tested. But again, there are regional differences in those. But on Definitely. average, um, those are the ones that we found that consistently. Uh, have the highest nitrate content. Yeah, then beetroots, we also mentioned that. Yeah, beets, you know, again, depending on, some beets have no nitrate, others have quite a bit. But in, huh. in terms of a spectrum or a hierarchy, they're probably, 
you know, middle upper. They're certainly not the highest. Um, so I think it's interesting that, that beets actually uh, yeah, were the that's... preferred delivery of nitrates in the marketplace. <laughs> I think actually that arugula, arugula is much higher. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's easier to grow beetroots or you get more... Uh, yeah, and I think there's a taste profile too that, that has oh, to be, be adopted by consumers. If companies are selling a product that tastes awful, um, you know, people people like <laughs> things that taste good, unfortunately. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So that's it. Okay, uh, I'm out of questions, and I think we've covered the topic very well, at least from the perspective of uh, introducing the topic. And uh, I think, Dr. Brian, you did a great job about summarizing all these things regarding the health benefits and what is important to look for when we are talking about supplements, how it works, uh, all these systems behind them and I really appreciate that you took the time to share with us all your knowledge and expertise into the topic. Well, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Again, it's it's, it's my pleasure and honor to, to, to educate your listeners and uh, hopefully we can do this again as we learn more. Yeah, I will be very happy to do so. So, as you already mentioned, uh, but just to recapitulate, where can people best reach you? Um, I think probably you, uh, um, my personal email is drnathanbryan at gmail.com. Um, they can follow me on Twitter at drnitric. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, my website, drnathansbryan.com. And uh, they can, I do a monthly, monthly blog that really provides hopefully good education and, and invaluable material for consumers to make smart choices. That's excellent. And all these links will be available in the podcast show notes. So anybody who's listening can head into them and there will be links available. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. So that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. All the important links are to be found in the podcast show notes. So there you will find links how to connect, how to reach my guests, how to reach myself. If you are looking for coaching experience to help with your nutrition, whether it's for performance or you just want to feel better, perform better, look better, then reach out to me and we can start working together. 